Hello, I'm Christopher Lyle Simmons, and you're in the IBA Boot Camp. This is video number two of three, and we're going over the review slideshow. This video is to be used as a reference. If you're unfamiliar with a lot of the material, then go ahead and watch it from the beginning to the end. If you find that you only have a few slides that you're unfamiliar with, just go ahead and fast forward to that section and listen to what I have to say. The information in the red is the most important. That's the information that has the most likelihood to show up on the certification exam. So kick back, enjoy the show, and I'll see you at the end. Web 2.0 continued. So first, let's talk about convergence. Uh, convergence is where your telephone goes through your internet. It's where telephone and data both combine together. Um, you know that little song by Vonage, woo -hoo, woo -hoo. That's when you're using um, the internet for your phone service. Before that, it was just done through its own separate cables. So um, convergence is telephone and data together. But unified communication is different. That's all communications combined. So that's going to be when someone's able to video chat with you, make a phone call with you, do uh, SMS, like kind of like text, instant message, all of these kinds of communications send you a digital fax. When all of them are starting to go into one sort of catch-all location, that's referred to as unified communication. So on a, the certif certification exam, just know that convergence is just telephone and data, right? Convergence or unified communication is when everything is combined. Let's talk about search en engines. Um, the first major search engine was Yahoo, and Yahoo was curated. It's not um, put together by a computer, although computers assist. Originally, Yahoo was a bunch of people sitting together and putting together the best websites for specific searches. So if you wanted to look up information on Benjamin Franklin, well, some sort of Yahoo librarian had put together the best of websites for that. It's changed since then, but it was the first major search engine. Excite um, is conceptual searches and cross-references. Um, it's not necessary that you know it, just know that it's conceptual. So when you look up um, not necessarily um, Benjamin Franklin, but you will look up uh, conservative presidents. Uh, Google is relevance, and this is just computer-based. All it does is it takes the search that you're looking for and looks through a giant database that it has, and whichever has the highest level of relevance and the most views is the one that it will bring up to the top. And Bing is a little bit more about how people recommend things. When you uh, are in Bing, uh, it's more like social media, um, and it uses that um, idea that a bunch of people can work together to, as we can see back here, you use crowdsourcing right here at the top in order to come up with the best searches for your um, whoops, the best searches for your query in a search engine. So Yahoo, first major search engine, Excite, conceptual, Google, relevance, and most likely that's what they're going to ask you about is Google, and it's based on relevance and Bing. Um, connecting to the internet. Now first, let's talk about more about search engines. Um, the search engines have, um, and this is really uh, both the search engine and more specifically your browser. Um, it has an interpreter. So the top of this should really say browsers as opposed to search engines. But you kind of think that they're the same thing. When you're inside Google Chrome, you think it's Google, which is the search engine, but Chrome is your browser. It has an interpreter, which means it looks at different types of um, languages. Your browser typically reads HTML. So if you took the certification last year, the interpreter interprets the HTML. It uses a rendering engine, which um, presents everything on the screen. Uh, typically, when you're just dealing with simple text in HTML, it'll draw it out for you. That's why each uh, web browser looks a little different, because they have a different rendering engine. But more specifically, when it's um, displaying JavaScript, when it's showing like animations and this kind of thing, uh, that's being created using the rendering engine. And then, of course, the sandbox. And the, the sandbox, um, in the old days, if all of a sudden you went to a bad web page, 
your entire computer failed. You just froze your whole computer. And now if you go to a bad web page, um, it sort of isolates it in the sandbox. And sometimes it'll spit out that little, uh, unable to communicate, would you like to wait? That's showing that it's been isolated from the rest of the systems in your computer and it's isolated in the sandbox. So interpreter, is the languages, HTML, FTP, um, whatever. Rendering engine is how it puts it on the screen for you. And the sandbox is how it um, isolates it. Just in case you get some bad code too, it's hard to click on a web page and for it to instantly crash your computer. You more like have to click download and that kind of thing for it to give you a Trojan horse kind of deal. Let's talk about connecting to the internet. Um, now, there's really six main things, and they're going to ask you um, which of the following is uh, the six correct things that you need to connect to the Internet. Obviously, you need a computer. That's number one. An operating system, which is like Windows, Linux. Um, that's pretty straightforward because your computer doesn't really operate without a uh, operating system. Um, you need TCP IP, uh, and that is the protocols, there's a transmission control protocol and internet protocol, TCP IP, and that's what takes uh, information and breaks it into little packets and spits them out onto the internet, and then it's also what um, brings the information back from the internet and looks at all the little packets. So um, the uh, transmission control protocol is the one that makes sure that um, you have all the correct packets before you start sending them out one at a time. So it's kind of like the slicer and dicer. And it's also the one, TCP, is the one that makes sure that if you're like downloading a song, that you at least get the first, you know, 20 seconds of the music before it starts playing by making sure they're all there. If it doesn't, it asks for those little pieces again. And internet protocol is just how the packets a run. Um, these little packets that go across the internet that are full of information. First they have to have the IP address of you so it knows where to send back the request and it has the IP address of where it's going and the IP address is using that DNS, the domain name system, right? You type in Instagram and Instagram comes up with a number and that number is what's put at the uh, tail end of your packet and the rest is the information, your username, password, they're all broken into little pieces and sent using TCP to break it up and IP so it sends itself along the way. You need a browser. The browser is really um, important stuff that you need to connect to the internet. Uh, there's other ways to go around it but mostly for you to be able to see web pages and go to specific spots, you need a browser. You need an internet connection, of course, that's number five, um, and that's usually provided by an ISP, an internet service provider. Your parents most likely pay for it, or um, sometimes you'll go to a library and you're using the county of Palm Beach, uh, pays an internet service provider to provide internet service. Um, the ISP really is the one that you're connecting to, and then that in turn is connecting out onto the internet. And they usually run their own domain name server, right, for the domain name system. The internet address is kind of like the, the, the top level domain name that you need, right? Uh, for exa example, um, www.apple.com. In reality, you're asking for HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, because you're looking for a web address, right? www is the name of the computer you're looking for on the internet, at Apple, which is in the area code or the top level domain of .com, which means it's commercial site. It's designed so that the company makes money. Everybody thinks that .com means .company, which is a good assumption, but it's .commercial for uh, making money not commercials like on TV. All right, let's look at the next one, right? The first three come with the computer. The last three are something that are software um, or protocols that are ran on the computer. Let's look at the next one. Connectivity. Um, PPOE is Ethernet connection. Um, these uh, is kind of like when we're at the school and we connect into the wall using the Ethernet. That's an Ethernet connection and it's super quick, right? And and from the school um, it connects. Now you might think, oh, it's not so fast, um, but imagine that there's you know usually about a thousand machines on campus at Krista running at once, um, all through one pipe going out to the internet, 
right? Um, but the way that they connect so quickly on campus is through the Ethernet. Um, there's old school dial up, you know, where you hear that ding, 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 ding. Um, it's very rare now that you use analog modems to connect to the internet, but they're still out there in rural areas and, and they're super slow. I, I mean, that's how I grew up with the internet and it was super slow. ISDN, um, digital connections to ISP, it, it's still dial up, um, but it's different because it's a digital line, not an analog line. So it's converting the information into digital signals as opposed to just uh, powers up and down. Digital signals means that it's uh, zeros and ones are really quick ons and offs. Um, analog's a little different. It's about the tones and stuff, you know. Um, DSL, uh, this is most likely what one, you have one of two things at home. DSL, which is digital direct connection. It's through a telephone company, but it's not um, ISDN. AT&T is DSL typically. So if you have AT&T providing your internet at home, well, that's a DSL. It's digital. It connects using zeros and ones, using binary code, um, but it's done through your telephone company, which is AT&T. Um, it's still using lines that were originally designed for telephone, so it's not a true connection like Ethernet, uh, but it's pretty quick. And then cable modem, which is digital, always on, and it's through your cable company. But once again, it's not for through cables that were designed specifically for connecting to the internet. Um, it's done through cables that were built to see movies and stuff through your cable box. And so either DSL or cable modem, um, both of them are, uh, they're using a modulator, demodulator, Mod modulator, M-O, demodulator, D-E-M, modem is modulate, demodulate, which means translate it to a language that's not quite binary and then back and forth. Uh, the last one is um, 802.11. Uh, that's wireless, and I don't know where we're at. We're at 802.11 F or FA. Or, I mean, there's we've had many different versions of it, but it's what's wireless. It's the uh, Wi-Fi in your house, and it's done over a radio signal, just like you would get radio um, through the air for your car or for a little Walkman or something. Um, it's the same type of signal. Let's move on to encryption. Now, this is difficult to understand. The best way to look at encryption is kind of like um, if you had a secret decoder ring, right? Where it has um, A through Z on, on one ring and you can spin around one through 26 around it, right? And you can get to a point where A equals three, then B would be four, or you can turn it around even more and A could be 18 and B could be 19, right? It's that kind of thing. Right, so the digital certi cer certificate encrypts. It's a separate file. Um, whoops, let me go back. Beep, beep, beep. A digital certificate encrypts. Um, what it's doing, it's a separate file, and it's kind of like the secret decoder um, key, right? Um, that's the key that tells you, um, okay, a will be 12 and B will be 13, C will be 14. It's a lot more complicated than that, but it's easy for you to understand if you're writing out a message, right? Um, so it has these keys through the digital certificate. And there's two ways that it can be done. It can be done um, symmetrically, which means everybody gets the same key. You know that A is 12 and you over there know that A is 12 and, and you guys can use the same key. Or when you have really complicated data, it could be asymmetrical, which is two different keys, right? Where you have A is equal to 12, and over there A is equal to 16 minus four, right? So even though they get to the same spot, the math is different. Now keep in mind that you're never sending out the letter A across the internet and the other person's, it's being translated to a number and then translated back to A. It's about the zeros and ones, and it's really large math that's taking place. So when you talk about digital certificates, that's the encryption, right? And it's a separate file. They send it usually first as a packet, and it says this is how we're going to encode or encrypt our stuff, right? And then you send out the packets, and each packet that goes across using TCP IP, 
is either following symmetric encryption, which means you're both using the same key, or asymmetric, which means as a sender, you're translating it one way using a specific, let's call it a math code. And when they get it over there, they're using a different math code, but it still comes up with the same result. There's the digital signature. And this is to verify identity. It's not encrypted. It's for something called um, non-repudiation. And what non-repudiation is used for is mostly like if there's a financial transaction that goes on. Um, everybody assumes that a lot of the traffic on the internet is done through web pages. But think, every time someone swipes their credit card, it's being converted into binary information and sent across the internet to a bank, right? Well, you, you don't, you kind of want to shake hands at the same time and say, I paid you and you got the money all at the same time. And we're even, we're straight. And the way you do that is through a di digital certificate, right? It makes sure that the person receiving the information is receiving it and is who they say they are and that you're the person that says that you are. So it's, it's sort of a um, handshake, right? You sign and say, we actually received the packets and we have all the information especially when it's a financial transaction, right? You can see how that works. And then hash encryption, it's some crazy math. I mean, totally insane math on how the encryption has worked. It's not symmetric. It's not um, asymmetric. It's hash encryption. Just keep in mind that there's no keys. It uses really advanced math in order to encrypt information. And we're talking like top secret information uses hash encryption, right? Or really heavy um, financial, financial information used to be done. To be honest, now some of the stuff is, is being done with hash encryption that's user base like Apple Pay now is using hash encryption. It's super secure that way because everybody's getting different information. It's super weird how it works. Just realize digital certificate encrypts with either symmetric, which is the same key, asymmetric, two different keys. Digital signature is saying, yep, we got the money and yep, you gave us the money. And hash is no keys, crazy math. It's almost impossible to uh, decode if you accidentally, you know, if you were like a bad guy and you stole the information as it was traveling across the internet, there's no way you can figure out what it's supposed to say. So let's talk about file formats. Now, every bit of information that goes out on the internet follows a different um, file format, right? Um, if it's something that's sent across. Um, we'll talk about audio. You know, when you're listening to audio, it can be something that's AU. Um, that's one that you really want to know. Um, AU, there's AVI, there's move, movie for um, video from apple.mov.avi.au, um, OGG. You just kind of need to memorize these. And there's a few that they're going to ask you about. And during some of the questions, it's going to ask you, um, just like uh, when if you'd taken the certification last year, it's pretty easy to remember what it was, right? MP3 is audio, MP4 is video. Dot MOV, movie, right? Dot OGG, um, it can be either audio or video. Multimedia programs. Um, we're going to talk about Adobe, which is Flash. Uh, it's for vector graphics. Um, these are things that are plugins that you typically need to have on your computer in order to see things. Now, if you're using Chrome, Chrome's really good, and, and you don't need any plugins for Chrome. If you're using something old, or you have Safari running, or you're running with uh, Internet Explorer, or an older version of Chrome, to be honest, you're going to need to download things to see something. Like if you go um, to Netflix and you go to watch a Netflix. Well, Netflix runs on Silverlight, so you would need to download Silverlight from Microsoft in order to run it. Or if someone sent you a video um, from their iPhone um, and you were look, trying to look at the video while you were on Internet Explorer on an older PC, you would need to download QuickTime in order to see the video, right? So they're just programs that are used for multimedia. Now, here is some bits of information that you need to have. Um, they're going to ask you, most likely, probably half of you, since you've probably already taken the cert, um, you've already seen the question and ask you which line is faster or slower or what. And this is about connections, right? 
T1 lines, here's the trick. A T1 line, it could be a T1 or E1. Um, e means Europe. But T1 is 1.544. It's the only one that's going to have that 1. And most likely they're going to ask about T1. They're going to ask you what's the difference between an E3 and a T3, um, which is E is for Europe. It may ask you about T1 and E1. Uh, T is North America, so it doesn't make sense, T, North America, but E, Europe. Then there's this question, IPv4, right? Um, what happened is when they came up with um, the, the internet and they came up with IP addresses, right? It's what's called a dotted quad. And, and basically, it's four, four numbers, right? And these four numbers can make up to four billion different IP addresses. And they thought, wow, we'll be good. We got four billion computers that it can talk to individually. But in reality, there's more than four billion computers on the internet now. So they've ran out and, and there's some duplication and they have to do it by region and it's really messy. So they've come up with IPv6. Um, and this is 128-bit instead of 32-bit, right? Uh, <laughs> it has more, you can connect every grain of sand in the Sahara, and you still would have extra um, IP addresses. It's designed for whenever we go out into the stars. It's a ridiculous number. We won't run out, maybe. <laughs> Not in our lifetimes, at least. Um, and that's enough about those connections. Let's talk about a license. And there's different licenses out there, but you just need to know that's the permission to use. You can have licenses that you pay for. Um, sometimes licenses are free, um, but the license is what permissions you have to use, right? Um, W3C, um, World Wide Web Consor Consortium, um, is the HTML standards, www consortium or W3C is those HTML standards. You should really just memorize that, right? That's all the standards. That's TCP IP, that's HTML, FTP, all those P's, those protocols, the rules are put together by W3C and it's a group of all the big companies in the in the world and governments in the world that decide that if we're going to have a form of communication on the internet that we need to all follow the same standards or rules. Um, ISO is just for business quality standards. Um, you don't have to worry about that one too much. Um, ICANN, and that's about domain names. And that's originally what came up with .com, .gov, .net. Um, they manage the domain names. And there's other domain names now that are out there that are beyond .com and .net, right? Um, and that's being managed by ICANN. I can manage domain names is the way to easily remember it. Okay. Um, this last one, Department of Defense, let me move this, um, first funded ARPA. So keep in mind that originally the uh, Department of Defense was who was um, funding the internet. Uh, the uh, the DARPAnet was the original um, version of it, and the ARPANET um, was the first sort of non-defense related network, and that's interconnected networks. Now, the, just a little background story, it's not about two computers talking to each other, it's about creating like a giant web so that if a bunch of connections break down, packets could still be routed all the way around the world. Uh, you would assume that if we were, uh, if you were trying to connect to a computer that's in Georgia, that it would just go kind of up the 95 and get to Georgia. Um, and there's a cable that runs up the 95. But that might not necessarily be true because it may be slower or full of information. Um, the internet sometimes routes information. Even if you're just talking to a computer in Georgia, it may go all the way out to Texas and then up to Detroit and then down to Georgia just to have the fastest, most reliable connection. It's pretty, pretty wild. Let's talk about malware. Now, malware is the bad stuff, right? 
malware is where um, viruses take place. Um, and these are, um, there's, there's three big things that you need to be aware of. A virus, which is something where you click a link yourself and then you got the virus, right? Um, usually for your smart smartphone, you may get a text from somebody you don't know and it says, congratulations, you just won a free uh, Apple Watch. Click this link to get more details. And you click the link and most likely you're getting a virus. Usually it comes through email, but occasionally it'll be on a website. If you go to a non-trusted website, um, you find a website that says uh, free Roblox or something silly like that, and you click on it. The website won't be what gets you, but when you're at the website, it would say click this link for your free whatever. When you click it, you're downloading a virus. So be careful on the links that you click. A worm is different. A worm is put together by someone who's really crafty, and you don't need to click on anything. You just need to be on the network. Uh, it's kind of like um, uh, you got to be real careful if you go to, let's say, Starbucks or McDonald's or something, and you connect to their free wireless. Uh, there could be a bad person somewhere on that network, and no matter what you do, because you've connected to the network, They've given you the worm and it, and it starts replicating itself. And then you go to another network, like at home, and you connect to it. And then um, that same worm will connect to all the other machines at your house, your, your parents' work computer, that kind of thing. So worms are more about which, connect, which network you decide to connect to. Viruses are about clicking on attachments or links. Um, and... Really, both of them, you can call it a Trojan, right? A Trojan horse, they call it. Um, and that's where it looks like it's something that's cool. Ooh, free. And then you click on it, and once it gets in, it, it jumps out and attacks you. Um, but really, you need to know virus. You do the action to get it in a worm. And there's nothing you can do once you connect to the network you're in. Um, and then an illicit server. And these are services that are bad. This is where you go um, and... You go to, uh, you search up Benjamin Franklin as a search, and you find a website that says all the information you need for your report on Benjamin Franklin, which seems a little too good to be true. When you go there, really what they're doing is designed specifically to try to give you a virus or connect you to a network to give you a worm, right? So that's kind of how that goes. This is the last one. All right, last one. We'll talk about fair use. And this is more again about permissions, right? We talked about permissions already a little bit. Um, open source means everybody can use it. Um, typically, there's a few things out there like Firefox is open source. There's a bunch of different services or software or things that are provided by the internet that are free because a bunch of people um, are volunteering their time and know-how to make sure that people don't have to pay for certain things that shouldn't be paid for. So that's called open source. Uh, copyleft is a little different. It's And it seems like a joke, right? Because a copyright means someone owns that information. A copyleft, is re it's real. It means it's in public domain. Um, but you still have to agree to some of the uses. Uh, a copyleft is open source typically, but they won't let you modify it and then try to sell it for money, let's say, right? So if it was like a cool web browser that was copy left and you get to download it for free and use it for free, um, you can't modify it with a new feature and then sell it somewhere else. So you're still sort of signing some legal paperwork in order to use it. Um, and all of this is done through the license, right? Which grants you permission for someone else to use. If you pay someone for their copyright, they'll give you a license in order to use it. If you sign off for a copyleft on an open source piece, uh, you still have the license to use it, but there's some certain restrictions. Fantastic. Well, that's a ton of information. So remember to kind of chunk the information. If you haven't looked at video number one, just spend one day on video number one. On the next day, go ahead and work on video number two, this two of three, and then tomorrow work on video number three. The, uh, the idea is that you're slowly exposing yourself over the next few days, getting yourself ready for the certification exam. We'll do the qualifier on Wednesday, and we'll be taking the exam for those who qualified on Thursday. See you all tomorrow. Bye.